In this podcast, we shall learn about supportive care for newborn on CPAP. The objectives of the session are learn the essential requirements for providing supportive care, know how to provide assessment of a baby on CPAP and how to optimize CPAP delivery. The essential requirements for caring for a newborn on CPAP include adequacy of personnel, equipment and close monitoring. Trained bedside personnel are the key. The bedside care is provided by doctors and nurses. The nurse to patient ratio should be ideally 1 is to 1. The personnel should be well versed with airway anatomy, pulmonary physiology of newborns, must have basic knowledge of CPAP, possess skills for patient assessment and have the ability to recognize and respond to adverse complications. The essential equipments required for caring for a newborn on CPAP are similar to that used for stabilization of sick newborns. These equipments which must be available bedside are resuscitation apparatus, suction source, suction catheter, pulse oximeter, NIBP monitor, orogastric tube, portable x-ray and access to ICD set. The third essential element for supportive care is bedside assessment. The goal is to monitor the trend over a period of time. The clinical assessment has to be focused which will be instrumental in the success or failure of CPAP. The assessment has to be ongoing, systematic, thorough and meticulous. Frequent assessment is the key. From clinical point of view, the assessment is directed to the newborn, to the CPAP interface and the CPAP delivery system. Remaining alert for changes in the infant's status will allow for earlier interventions, increasing the success of CPAP, minimizing the complications. Clinical assessment begins with bedside observation. The purpose of general evaluation is to gain an overall impression on the condition of the baby based on visual and auditory clues without touching the baby. The purpose is to quickly identify if the baby is stable or unstable. General evaluation focuses on appearance, work of breathing and color. Appearance should gain information as to what is the comfort level of the baby. Is the baby quiet? Is it crying or is it fighting? How is the tone, activity, posture and movements? Breathing assessment includes work of breathing and grunt. The pink color of the baby is assuring and suggests stability. This should be followed by assessment of the vital parameters. The vitals provide information about the cardiorespiratory stability and assessment should include temperature, heart rate, respiration, blood pressure, saturation and urine output. This is followed by systemic examination. The circulatory status is judged by heart rate, peripheral pulses, pulse volume, capillary refill time, blood pressure, urine output, sensorium and pulse oximetry. This helps to define adequacy or inadequacy of perfusion. None of these signs by themselves alone are diagnostic of shock and one needs to take all of these into considerations for interpretation. Mind that the fall in blood pressure is a late sign of shock. Presence of shock variants search for the underlying cause. One must remember that if more than excessive CPAP pressure is being delivered, it may also lead to poor perfusion. The CNS assessment includes assessment for sensorium, activity, tone and responsiveness. Worsening sensorium should alert to underlying hypoxia. Increase or decrease activity is both worrisome. The GI assessment should look for abdominal distension and presence or absence of bowel sounds. Babies on CPAP should have an orogastric tube to vent off air. 
quickly survey the CPAP settings to define is the baby getting the set FiO2, CPAP pressure and flow. The settings also guide you to what support the baby is receiving and what is the severity of underlying illness. No doubt the focus is on respiratory assessment. An objective bedside way to assess respiration is to use the Silverman score. The score essentially is clinical and includes five parameters the upper chest retractions, the lower chest retractions, xiphoid retractions, nasal flaring and audible grunt. Based on the assessment, you can grade the severity as grade 0, 1 or 2. The scoring is done at every assessment. Rather than one assessment, look at the trend of the score which is more informative. A score of 7 or more suggests respiratory failure. Clinically assess the airway and the breath sounds. Divide the chest into right and left sides and then divide each side into upper, middle and lower thirds. Auscultate and compare the differences between the right and the left side. Note the quality of breath sounds in each area and compare with the baseline assessment to define is the distress the same, improving or worsening. The interface is the contact of the CPAP system with the infant's airway. The assessment should be made for the size, position and appropriate fixation of the interface as this is a key to prevent underlying tissue damage. At every opportunity, assess the nose, nostrils, nasal septum, adjoining skin over the face. Assess for color, perfusion, watch for blanching, redness, bleeding, crusting and for possible areas of pressure or excoriation. If there is any blanching of the nares or the bridge is pressing against the septum, the prongs must be repositioned or changed to the appropriate size. The interface should be taken off every 3-4 to four hours during the process of suctioning and the nose and adjoining structures should be massaged to prevent congestion. The assessment for CPAP system should include checking for set temperature on the humidifier, presence of condensate in the tubings, water level and presence or absence of bubbling if the baby is on underwater bubble CPAP. Positioning of newborn on CPAP is an art. Nursing consideration should include how best to optimize the position of the baby on CPAP to make things as comfortable as possible. The ideal position for a newborn on CPAP is that which promotes comfort and optimal airway. The prone position is often the preferred position, but there is no evidence in the literature that the prone position is superior. It is recommended that infants be repositioned at least every 2 to 4 hours. Repositioning is essential to the infant's neurodevelopmental and respiratory outcomes and allows for thorough assessments by the infant's caregivers. One should ensure avoiding excessive flexion, extension or rotation of the head and neck. Newborns in all positions should be properly supported by roles to form boundaries for containment, comfort and ease. Once infants on CPAP are beyond the acute phase of RDS, they may be provided kangaroo care. During all such positions, one must ensure that the CPAP remains in the nares and does not become twisted during postural changes. Airway care for a newborn on CPAP means ensuring that the airway is clear of secretions and the nasal septum is protected from damage. A baby on CPAP is likely to have increased production of mucus which is a normal phenomena because of presence of prongs in the nares. The presence of excessive secretions will narrow the airway and increase the effort of breathing. It may cause increased oxygen requirement, obstructive apnea, bradycardia or rarely pneumothorax. The newborns therefore frequently needs to be suctioned to prevent narrowing of the airways and increased work of breathing. 
universal precautions should be taken during suctioning. Suctioning is a delicate procedure and if done too roughly will cause mucosal damage, bleeding and or swelling. While suctioning, moisten the nares with normal saline or sterile water to lubricate the catheter and loosen dry the secretions. Thickening of secretions indicates the need of increasing the humidity of the gas or increasing the temperature of the gas. Always keep a note of the color, consistency and quantity of nasal secretions. There are no contraindications for feeding a newborn on CPAP once the baby is stable. The newborn on CPAP can be fed using bolus, intermittent gastric feeds or when stable oral feeds. An orogastric tube is preferred. Due to oral secretions, the orogastric tube is prone to slipping in position. The position therefore should be monitored carefully and adjusted necessary on regular basis. The tube should be aspirated to remove air every 4 to 6 hourly as abdominal distension affects the lung volume and alters the work of breathing. Providing adequate nutrition should be a priority. One must start early enteral feeds. Trophic feeds or minimal enteral nutrition should be practiced till the newborn condition becomes stable. Then the enteral feeding can be progressively increased as per unit protocol. If the condition is likely to be unstable over next 72 hours or more, parental nutrition should be planned. Daily order for fluids should have calculations for energy intake. Some babies on CPAP develop abdominal distension which is commonly called CPAP belly. This is due to accumulation of air in the stomach and should not be a reason for withholding feeds. To prevent such a happening, an orogastric tube should be left in situ with its proximal end open to atmosphere to prevent gaseous distension. This condition is essentially benign. Signs of improvement for a baby on CPAP include the comfort level of the baby, minimal or no chest retractions, normal capillary refill time and blood pressure and SpO2 in the normal range. Signs of worsening distress signal the need to re-evaluate the infant's clinical condition and the level of CPAP support which is being provided. A portable X-ray is useful for a baby on CPAP. X-ray is useful at three stages. Initially to confirm the diagnosis, to look for the adequacy of CPAP pressure and to confirm air leaks in case of acute deterioration. At least one X-ray should be required initially for establishing the diagnosis. Presence of visible 6 to 8 rib spaces suggest adequacy of CPAP pressure. Ideally, blood gases should be done for a baby on CPAP. But most babies with mild to moderate disease can be managed without a blood gas. What is needed however is continuous pulse oximetry with set alarm limits of SpO2 between 89 to 95% which is mandatory. If a baby has good respiratory efforts and normal blood pressure and capillary refill time, one may presume that the pH and the pCO2 are normal. The high CO2 in a spontaneously breathing newborn with mild to moderate distress would occur either because of poor respiratory efforts or an air leak, both of which can be diagnosed clinically. Fluid should be administered as per standard protocol for a baby on CPAP. One should ensure adequacy of hydration avoiding over or under hydration. There is no role to routinely restrict fluids. One should monitor the urine output as presence of diuresis in RDS precedes clinical recovery. Fluid therapy is titrated as per the clinical condition, weight, urine output and looking at the electrolytes.
Hydrogenic blood loss due to sampling is a cause of concern. This predisposes to the need for blood transfusion. One should therefore maintain a chart to record the amount of blood volume withdrawn for tests. One should minimize the lab tests and also ensure minimal volume of blood required for performing a lab test. It is always essential that the hematocrit be kept above 40% during the acute phase and one should follow stringent criteria for blood transfusion. For optimizing the outcomes, developmentally supportive care needs to be supported and practiced. Simple measures include swaddling, containment, promoting day and night cycle by lighting, minimizing sound levels in the NICU and encouraging the mother to participate in caring for the baby. Infection control measures include simple strategies like hand washing, minimizing pricks to the baby, early feeding with human milk, reducing the duration of IV fluids, IV excess, lines, tubes and catheters, objectively documenting infection and early extubation. Disposable nasal CPAP kits are recommended and are intended for single patient use. The circuits need to be changed every 5 to 7 days. Certain therapies have no role for a baby on CPAP. These include chest physiotherapy, steroids, diuretic, soda bicarb, sedatives or paralyzing agents. Every baby should have a CPAP monitoring chart which provides information about the care being provided to the baby every 2 to 3 hourly which is being recorded. The supportive care thus is ongoing systematic clinical assessment of the baby, CPAP interface and CPAP delivery system. Special focus should be given to the positioning, care of the airway, nutritional support and infection control. Every week take a look at the overview of care provided, problems encountered, re-evaluate the investigation reports and track the growth and nutrition of the baby, anticipate complications to ensure comprehensive provision of care. Thus, the supportive care for newborn on CPAP is a combination of dedicated teamwork, meticulous monitoring with a humane approach. This shall ensure you have more and more babies with better and good outcomes both short and long term while being cared on CPAP. Thank you.